What's up, basketball coaches, players, and fans? Welcome to the Pass First podcast, where we share our knowledge of the game. My name is Alex Engel, and I'm here with my partner, Augie Johnston. We hope you're able to take something away from today's episode that will help you on this basketball journey. Today, we're going to be talking about becoming an elite point guard. Uh, Augie and I both have played a little bit of point guard in our time, so we're going to dive right into that and give some tips on how to become a better player at the point guard position. If you've been watching us on YouTube, listening on iTunes, or following us on Spotify, please make sure to hit that like and subscribe button as it really helps us grow and become a better channel. So without further ado, let's get right into today's episode. All right, welcome in everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as I introed earlier, we're gonna be talking about how to become an elite point guard. And we're gonna start it off today, Og, with me just asking you, I know I talked about it a little earlier, but um, have you played point guard and what were your experiences at that position? Yeah, I always considered myself a point guard up until really college. And I went into college thinking I was gonna be able to play point guard still, but um, wasn't able to. And uh, in high school, uh, I was a point guard that uh, was a pass first point guard. You know, I was never lightning quick. I was never able to, you know, pick up full court. I was, you know, more of a combo guard really, but um, I did play the point. And, uh, you know, I, I really thought that I was a, you know, extension of the coach on the floor. And, and those are pretty much, I think the reasons that I was placed in that position, not because I was a typical point guard, but um, yeah, I, I did play it. And uh, I played a little bit overseas as well. Uh, but but really none in college. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I had a similar experiences in some ways where definitely in college for me, I was more of what I would consider like a systems point guard where I got the team set up, you know, tried to be a leader on the floor, you know, took my opportunities when I had them, but I wasn't out there like, you know, looking to shoot every time I had the ball. Um, maybe as I got a little older into my career, into my senior year, I was looking to score a little more, but generally more of kind of just like a steady systems point guard. When I was younger, um, more of like tried to score a lot more, you know, I think more was interested in just getting my own buckets. And I didn't really think that at a point guard position, that's not always necessarily the best thing. Okay? And partly maybe that's why I didn't play as much as I wanted to when I was younger. Right. So as I got older, my game shifted a little bit um, as well. But I think maybe, maybe we had some similarities there uh, as far as being kind of a systems point guard. Um, okay. So when you're thinking about, an elite point guard okay and what you want as a coach what are some of the characteristics you're thinking about yeah so if we're talking about elite well that's a little bit next level so i guess i'll go into it but i, I like my point guards to be able to shoot from the outside and that was one thing that i wasn't great at in high school was i wasn't a great shooter um and i wasn't a great scorer at the point guard position i was the type that would uh you know maybe take one shot a game sometimes probably one of those players where uh, coaches would be like, Hey, shoot it. You know, like when you're open passing up shots, you know? Um, and you know, I was, a, I was a pretty much like the ultimate team guy. And that's kind of the reasons it wasn't like I was scared to shoot, you know, some games I'd rattle off 20 points, but, um, majority of the games, you know, I was scoring like two, but as far as elite point guard goes, yeah. Being able to shoot, of course, pass. And when we say pass, pass with both hands, pass with one hand, which most coaches don't really like, but I actually support that. And, and we practice that. Um, and then just, you know, like I said, an extension of the coach on the floor, you know, understands, you know, oh, we're in bonus, huddle up the team. You guys, we're in bonus. Let's drive. Let's get to the basket. You know, stuff like that um, is pretty much what I'm looking for in a point guard. I'll, I'll, I'll also, picking up full court. I love point guards that can pick up full court. My, uh, player, uh, my teammate in college could pick up full court very well. And uh, so we never really had to press. We never really had to do any kind of gimmicks or anything defensively. He would just pick up full court, take them out of what they're doing. And uh, it was like, I just noticed in college, it was so valuable for our team. So, yeah. Okay. And I think the, uh, you know, just a couple of things that I would want to add in there. And I guess you touched on the IQ a little bit, but just, I like really high IQ point guards. And I think that's a, an elite characteristic. Also a point guard that can play at a good pace which I think um, is maybe kind of ambiguous for a lot of people. But I guess what I mean by that is, or maybe I should say a point guard that understands pace is, is makes them elite is they know when to go. They know when to play fast. They also know when things are getting out of hand and when to slow it down. Um, and I think that's something that I don't see that often is a lot of times I, just at both levels, you know, teams just go, 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 go. And they may get multiple bad possessions in a row and they don't have the ability to like slow themselves down and say, okay, let's get a good one, you know, and really that falls on the point guard in my opinion. So I like that as well. Um, 
and then just some other characteristics. I mean, obviously there's athletic characteristics that you can look at as well, right? If you're really quick, you're very shifty, um, good lateral movement, explosiveness, but I think that can, that can probably be applied to most, uh, point guards. And I don't want to say that as the only factor because some people are just not as explosive as others. And I think all the other characteristics we've listed are things that you can learn or actually, you know, work at and become uh, better. Again, not that you can't become more explosive or more athletic, but as we know, people generally have a, a ceiling to their own body, you know, as far as how, how explosive they can get. Um, so yeah, I just think those are some other things I'd want to add in there. Anything else you can think of? Um, no, I mean, there, there's, there's a ton of stuff that we could go into, but I mean, we don't need to reveal every little detail of, of the conversation right now. So let's just keep on going with the conversation. Okay. Um, so what about when we're talking that, you know, we talk a lot about the skills and things that you need. What about when we're talking intangibles? Uh, what are you looking at with intangibles with the point guard? Yeah. So, uh, IQ. And when we say IQ, um, you know, the stuff that we just kind of talked about, you know, realizing, recognizing certain things. Oh, mismatch, right? Like, why does the coach have to call a timeout and call up a play for somebody? If you're an elite point guard and you have good intangibles, then you are, you know, setting up a play and, you know, pointing to your teammate. No, switch, get in corner, corner, go corner, you know, because you know you're going to try to call a play for him to get him a shot. So that would be, you know, an IQ intangible thing. Um, taking charges and stuff like, you know, that that grit, that toughness that you want in a point guard that, um, it's pretty, that's an intangible that I, that I think is pretty valuable. Um, and just the one intangible thing that I think might be overlooked a lot in point guards is just the ability to win. Right. So we say, Oh, you know, we like pass first point guards that are unselfish, get everyone involved and stuff. But I like a point guard that just understands how to win. And whether that's him, him being selfish to get us to win or him being unselfish to get us to win, that would be, that's a good, um, intangible because, I mean, I, I know when I was playing overseas and would play point guard, I always would approach the game kind of the same way. First, you know, first five minutes, it's ultimate unselfishness. You know, can we build a lead playing like this? If we can build a lead with me just distributing, then, and, you know, then that's how we're going to play the game. You know, but if, you know, I'm unselfish here and, and playing like this and, you know, we're losing, then it's on me to like, you know, figure out, okay, do I need to be more aggressive? Do I need to try to get to the free throw line? Do I need to, you know, defensively do something? Do I need to switch? Do I need to tell my, do I need to huddle my teammates on a free throw and say, no, 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 I'm guarding him or, you know, you're guarding him now and stuff like that. Those are the, the IQ intangibles that I can think of. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, part of that too is being like a vocal leader, you know, being oh, able yeah. to, to, and I guess you kind of said it when you're like, hey, you know, put, point someone out, go to the corner, get him a shot or whatever, but just being vocal on the court, yeah. uh, being an extension of the coach there. Um, in, in my opinion, when you're a point guard, even if you're not a captain, you are really a captain. You're like an honorary captain, you know, at all yeah. times because you're leading the team, you know, whether you have that title or not. So I think it's important to be a vocal leader as well. Um, but I think you kind of hit, hit the nail on the head with all, a lot of those other characteristics. And there's just a lot of responsibility that falls on the point guard, you know, um, I, I know I've had a lot of coaches that have told me and other teammates of mine that were point guards that, Hey, when things are going, you know, when things are not going well, I'm going to go to you and look to you and I'm going to put that pressure on you. And is that fair? Maybe not, but it's part of the responsibility. It's part of the job, you know? And when things are going great, it doesn't mean you're always going to get all the praise either. Right. You might be the one distributing and setting one up, everyone up. And some guy might have 30 and everybody's going to look in the newspaper article about the guy that had 30. Right. But you could have been just as important, but you may not always get the praise. So I don't want to say it's a thankless job, but I think um, it's, it's one of those positions that there's a lot of, of responsibility required in multiple aspects on the court. And, um, you know, if you're not mentally ready for that, it can be tough. You know, some players are just not built for that. And I think it's a lot easier to go. I know we may get into this more later, but to go from playing a, a point guard and going to a two or a three, let's say, you know, if you have that ability to play multiple positions, than it is to go from playing a two to a three and going to play the one. I think it's an easier transition the other way because you're already used to having all the responsibilities. You're used to knowing you know, every play. I remember some of my coaches saying, you need to know every play and not only the play, but where the players on the court go during that play, you know? So mm -hmm. as the four and the five, like my coaches say, oh, the four and the five, you need to know the four and the five positions, right? The two, you need to know the three and the three needs to know the two point guard. You got to know all five positions on every play because mm -hmm. you've got to set them up, you know? And that's, that is a lot of responsibility. So um, yep. those are just some other things I wanted to add in there. So, 
Yeah, if you were to compare it to other sports, right, the point guard is like the quarterback, right? He's got to be, you know, the leader. He's got to know, have, probably have one of the highest IQs on the team. And as far as intangibles, like some other things that just kind of popped into my head is like time and score. You want your point guard to understand time and score at all times and, you know, recognize when we need to foul at the end of games or, you know, when we need to call a timeout or, uh, you know, whether we need to slow it down at the end of the game to run out the clock, that kind of stuff is also, I guess, an IQ thing, but um, definitely an intangible. Um, so, yeah, that was just another thing I wanted to add. Okay. So then how do we develop these characteristics? You know, if there's somebody listening in or a coach or a player and says, okay, I want my point guard to get better. Or I want to be a better point guard. How do you develop some of those characteristics? Yeah. I mean, just this kind of like a, I don't know, like a gimme answer, but you got to watch college basketball and stuff to understand, I think, some of these things. And or not just college basketball, but high school basketball as well. But that's how I learned, you know, as a point guard, I, I would, you know, that's how I recognized, oh, you know, how do you foul at the end of games and when you should foul. And, you know, um, that's when I learned, um, you know, I would, I'd recognize, you know, okay, different point guards are, are, you know, pushing the pace at certain times and slowing it down at certain times and um, those kind of things. So I think watching and learning that way is, is a good way to, to develop those IQ type things and those quarterback type skills. Um, but of course there's all kinds of other ways to develop the skills. And I guess you can go ahead and talk, talk about your, your ideas on that. Yeah. I, I think one other thing too, is not only watching film, just to add on to what you were saying, not only watching film of other players, but watching your own film, I yeah. think that's really valuable. And, and, you know, it's not always possible, right. Um, to, to do that if you don't have a filmer and a setup like that, but if you can get hands on your own film and watch it, because you can see where you made mistakes, where you can improve. Um, and it's easier to hold yourself accountable with that. But, um, you know, as far as the skills go, I don't want to say that um, you should ever like forego certain areas of your game, you know, because I think any player should be more well-rounded. But obviously, like if you're playing a point guard, you're going to be looking to work more on any of your perimeter skills. And I know we're going to get into more details of this later, so I'm trying not to dive too much into it right now, but you're obviously going to be working on a lot of your more perimeter oriented skills, you know, getting shots up, um, working off of the ability to like understand how to come off a screen, how to make reads off of that. And I think some of those skills too are learned, not just through skill work, um, but through playing, you know, and, and playing in either, club when you're younger or AU as you grow up um, being in, in a you know with a program that teaches some of those things and and just playing even just playing pickup you know like doing stuff like that um, but I think especially if you can get into organized basketball and just get a lot of games in for any position it's going to help you with your understanding of not only how to play the game overall but how to play your position specifically um, and ideally you get a coach somewhere down the line that that understands the game well enough to to teach it to you you know and I think um, at the youth level, sometimes that can be hard to find because, you know, you usually just have like volunteer people coming out there just trying to get kids on the court, which is great, you know, and obviously that helps, but it's not, you're not always going to find some coach that's going to be like, all right, let's break this down at fifth grade. I'm going to, you know, teach you how to come off a screen and roll and find all the reads. Like usually you don't find that type of a coach until you get a little older. So mm -hmm. just another thing that I was thinking about. Yeah. And that, that's a good point you just brought up. I mean, if you're a point guard wondering, how can I get better? How can I, what should I work on? You got to work on ball screens. You got to know every ball screen read. You got to practice against hedging defenses, you know, trapping, all that kind of stuff, especially with how the game is played nowadays. I mean, pretty much any college you go to, there's going to be some sort of ball screen incorporated. And even if it's just end of shot clock stuff, right? I mean, like that's mm -hmm. what we do a lot is, you know, it's, 10 seconds left in the shot clock. I want my, if, depending who has the ball, but normally I want my, my point guard coming for a handoff to get it so that we can get into a ball screen and hopefully get a shot off, you know, as the clock ticks down. So um, yeah, ball screen development, splitting ball screens, all that kind of stuff. I think it's huge. Mm -hmm. and, and I think too, finding one other thing for point guards is finding the balance of when to score and when to not like when to distribute, you know, I think that's another thing that I've noticed is more of a trend lately where scoring point guards are becoming more, more popular. Um, and, you know, as we talked about for a long time as a point guard, it was just like, Hey, just get the ball around, you know, if you score great, but it's not that big of a deal. And now I think there is a little more of an, not only expectation to score, but on top of that point guards are looking more to score. And, and sometimes I think that's good. Like, don't get me wrong. I think it is good to have a guy. If you have a point guard and get you 15 or 20, that's great. But at the same time, 
I find that there are times where that balance goes so far to scoring that like they don't get their teammates involved and it can actually be detrimental to the team. You know, nobody, I mean, I, I know we all probably heard this, but nobody likes it when a point guard comes down, pounds the, you know, the air out of the ball for like 15 dribbles and jacks up a shot and nobody else touches the ball. Like that's terrible, but that's what happens a lot. And if you watch, you know, certain, not all, but like certain levels of AAU or certain, you know, areas of AAU that's what it turns into you know or if you go to like a showcase and you watch kids play it especially showcases and events like that one kid brings it down pounds the crap out of the ball and then jacks up a shot you know and it's like okay yeah I guess if you make every shot that's great but realistically you're not and so you're just kind of alienating your teammates you know and you have to realize in a real game there's going to be chemistry you know guys want to touch the ball they want to have some purpose for being on the court nobody wants to just stand in the corner you know clapping their hands for 40 minutes a game um so I think point guards have to be able to understand that as well, that you really do control who's going to see the ball and touch the ball. And if you can't realize that you can make it more difficult for your team to win and have good chemistry, you know? Yeah. As soon as the point guard, you know, starts pounding the ball and no one else is getting shots, then you'll start to see more bad shots from players that normally don't take bad shots because they haven't gotten a shot. Um, but you know, it all depends on your team dynamic, right? If your point guard is just elite and no one else right. is, then he's obviously going to be taking all the shots. You're going to run your offense through him. But I mean, right. but still, no matter what, your point guard is going to be the one that has the ball. You know, that's why everybody wants to play point guard, especially at the youth level, right? Everyone wants to be the point guard. And that uh -huh. was a tough pill for me to swallow when I went to college and was told, you'll never play point guard here. And that was hard for me to swallow. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? But luckily, um, I had a coach that was like really excited about me playing the two and stuff and convinced me that it's better. And in the end, um, I like, I actually like playing the two better because you don't got to get picked up full court and have all eyes on you and have to bring the ball up, which I never was that great at you. Um, you, you know, for me, I had the green light finally, which I never had, you know, I was always, like I told you one shot per game, like a lot of times. And all of a sudden I was, you know, able to shoot whenever I wanted and stuff. So, mm -hmm. and, and also too, like, I felt like I had more, like, being, you got to be in great shape. That's one thing we haven't mentioned. If you want to be a point guard, you probably need to be in the best shape, especially if you're d up full court, getting picked up full court, you know, like it's exhausting. And I remember um, playing the two, like for the first few times as a freshman in college and being like, man, I'm never getting tired out here. Cause I'm just like running down to the corner and just like <laughs> letting them do all the work on defense. They're just hiding me and putting me on like the other shooter, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, I just got to be in great shape too. Yeah. No, you, that's a good point, actually. And that's something that I didn't really ever, I didn't think about too much. So you just said that, about how, how good a shape you have to be in. And, and I, for myself, I was always in pretty good shape, not because I, in my head, I was like, well, I'm a point guard. I need to be in good shape just because I was like, well, I don't want to be, you know, the last guy running through the, the liners or whatever every time. But uh, that's true. You, you're going to be moving a lot as well. Um, and then just kind of a, a funny thing when you're talking about everybody wants to be the point guard, you know, every year, like when I was coaching at Cuesta, almost every year, we would have all our guys come in and like, you know, half the team as they walk in, Oh, I'd be like, hey, what position you play, you know, or whatever, wh wh where you play at. And literally like half the team, Oh, I play point guard. Oh, I play point guard. And it's like, you go online, you're like, okay, you see like a five ten guy, five eleven guy, six foot guy. You're like, okay. Yeah, I can see that. And you're getting like six, six guys, six, seven guys. Oh yeah. I play point guard. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> you think you play point guard, but you don't play point guard. Like there's no, and then you see them on the court and like, you know, they're not that they're bad players, obviously college guys, but they're not point guards. And it's just like everybody in their head, like you said, they're like, Oh, I'm a point guard back home. I'm like, how, how are you a point guard? Like, how, why? just because you want to be a point guard, you're a point guard, you know? Well, you know uh, what? I mean, they probably were point guards or they, they may, might, might have, have, you know, they might have, they might have played point guard right. on some rinky dink team, you know, like, not that I had a rinky dink team, we had a really good team, but um, I was able to pull it off. But, and then going into college for me, you know, they, they told me you're not going to play point guard. I was, I wasn't six, eight or six, six, whatever you said, I was six, two. But then I looked over at the guys that were trying out for point guard and they were like, five nine lightning quick could dunk you know like just cats on the court like crazy fast and, and eventually I was like okay now I get what they're saying like they got these guys that can like are typical like standard point guards that are going to do all the things that they want like you can't steal it from these guys me like I'm shaky bringing it up you know so uh anyways yeah I mean those those guys maybe they did play point guard previously so yeah. No, and also, true. also too, there's this, this, um, misconception, right. That, Oh, at the next level, you're, you're, you're going to have to play point guard. You know, there, there's no five, 10, two guards in college. There's no, you know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a misconception that everyone that you hear a lot mm -hmm. that at the next level, like I thought that when I was going overseas, like, Oh, I'm going to have to play point guard. I'm only six, two, like, 
playing the two, like the, the wings that are bigger. But I mean, height is just, that doesn't mean anything, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think teams ideally like bigger point guard, I mean, uh, sorry, bigger wings than point guards, but like, I know you, I could tell you when I was, when I was a junior and I was, uh, let's see, yeah, my junior year at Menlo, we had our, uh, our senior, you know, captain who was, uh, his name, Julian Harris, who's all time leading scorer at Menlo history was all American as a senior, like, you know, led us to, to a conference title and he's same height as me he's five ten. you know, and he played shooting guard all four years and was like, I mean, just a killer, like one of the best, honestly, one of the best scorers and shooters I've ever played with. And he wasn't that big, but he could score with anybody, you know, with like the best of them. So yeah, you're right. Like it doesn't always, it's not always perfect, you know, science where it's like, Oh, you're five ten, you're a point guard, you know, Oh, you're six, three, you're a shooting guard. Like it, it can depend on your skill set, how well you can play. I played shooting guard sometimes because I could shoot it, you know, and they, they'd play two point guards and usually they'd put me off, off the ball and our other point guards were bigger than me, you know, but they'd play them at the one and put me off the ball sometimes because I could shoot it better than they could. Um, so it all depends on kind of where you're at. Uh, with your own skill set, I think as well. But yeah. did you have something else you wanted to add before I get to oh, the next topic? Sure. Yeah. One one thing just popped in my head as far as that goes. Like, um, it really is your style of play and your skill set that makes you what position you are. Because I mean, you can look at Derek Jasper that played at Paso, right? He was what six seven, a six six, six six. Yeah, six six, six six. six, six, six. Yeah, probably probably listed as six six. Um, and he was a point guard, you know, high school, college, you know, every team he played on and he was tall, but his, if you ever watched him play, you would instantly think that's a point guard. You would never look at him and be like, Oh, he's a, he should be in the post. He's six, six, you right. know, yeah. but he, right. no, he's not a post player. Like he was a pure point guard. So anyways. Yeah, no, that's true. That's a good point. Uh, I, that's definitely dictated by your skills. Um, okay. So then, what are uh, let's talk about styles of play of point guards. What are some of the different styles that we see traditionally? You know, obviously there's tons, but what are some of the more traditional styles of play with the point guard? Sure. Um, so obviously there's scoring point guards um, that we see like in the NBA. You know, James Harden's playing point guard, Westbrook's playing point guard. You know, I don't know those those kind of point guards, and you see them in high school too, of course. Um, but the, the the ones the one type of point guard that I always was fascinated by because maybe that's because my was more my style was like the taller, maybe even chubbier, slow point guard that you just could not stop because they would just get you on your hip, get you on the hip, right? They would just mm -hmm. get you on their hip. They'd get that little chicken wing out and just hook you right there and just control you down the court. And so like, like Mark Jackson, right? If you're talking about an old school kind of point guard like that, where it wasn't quick, you could pick him up full court, but you'd never take the ball from him because you would, you would only be like, four feet away from the ball at all times because they just knew how to position their bodies and stuff. So um, I know in college, like I said, we had a five, nine point guard, lightning quick, you know, great score, great everything. And we played uh, Cal state LA and our point guard went off for 40. Their point guard went off for 40 and their point guard was like six, four, couldn't even touch the rim slow, but he was just a beast down there, dude. I don't know what it, I don't know how, he couldn't shoot that well. He was like more of a mid range guy, but I guess it's just a matchup thing, you know? And, and that guy's name is a uh, Vincent camper. He's like a drew league, like legend now. And uh, he played overseas and all that stuff too. But I guess that would be the other kind of type of point guard that you, you might see is like, how does this guy play point guard? But they're more of like the floor general type, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And another style I think of is like when you, you know, we talk about like small point guards. I think that height thing with a point guard position does sometimes change your style of play because, you know, if you're a smaller player, unless you're like a real freak athlete where you're just playing at or above the rim at, you know, at five, nine, five, ten. 10, um, generally it's, it's a little tougher to score inside, you know, let's be honest. Like for me at five ten, it's a little tougher for me to score inside than it is for, for, for you or for someone who's, you know, six, three, six, four. So because of that, that does somewhat dictate how you may play. You know, if, if, I was only able to drive to the rim and I couldn't shoot. I may have never been able to play in college, you know, probably to be honest, I probably wouldn't have been able to because it's hard for you to be a consistent scorer at five, nine, five, ten, right at the basket when you're going up against six, seven, six, eight guys, you know, mm -hmm. um, maybe in high school, it might work depending on where your league and you're playing at, but probably definitely not in college. I don't think it's generally speaking as effective. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I had to be able to shoot. 
Um, and I think for smaller guards, usually they got to be able to shoot it at least at a decent percentage. Yeah. Um, otherwise they're not gonna be effective. And I think, like you said, as a bigger point guard, it can change. So one other style I was just saying is for the little, little guards that are like, you know, controlling the pace, um, quick can get into the paint, but don't necessarily score a lot in the paint. They just get in there, crash, collapse the defense and kick out. And then they're just like, you know, knockdown shooters are pretty good shooters. Um, and I think that's like kind of another style is that little small, that, you know, that point guard that we're talking about. I don't know what you would call that, but um, I like guess more of a shooting point guard, right? Um, you know, you have the traditional pass first, which when you really think back on that, a lot of times those players couldn't really shoot from, from distance right. um, because they were so used to getting everyone else the ball. Um, but those are just a couple other ones that popped into my head when we think about different styles of play. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned, I was more of a pass first type point guard. And it's hard, I think, to be both. It's hard to be a great passing point guard. Well, maybe not, but just hear me out on this. Because for me, one of the struggles that I always faced was the mentality of pass, pass the ball, get, you know, like I'm looking to pass, I'm, I'm out driving, I'm looking to pass, and then shooting. You know, like I would always catch it and have be thinking of the next step ahead, which I thought, you know, was good, right? I was always one step ahead of the defense, you know, I felt like a, a many times. But then I would be, like I said earlier, I'd pass up shots because I was like trying to think too much maybe. Um, but it was hard for me to like, be like, okay. It, and even in college when I played the two and like, oh, you need to play the one for a little bit. Like I was still gunning. Like it would hard for, it'd be hard for me to like go back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyways, that's just, that's just one thing that I, I noticed um, that can be challenging for players is going from being, you know, 100% pass to, okay, now I got to shoot it. So Another, another actually type of point guard that's out there that we didn't mention is like the defensive guy, right? Like, oh, he, he can't shoot, can't, you know, he can bring it up. You can't take it from him, can't really score. He's not going to put up any points, um, but he's got lockdown defense and he's your starting point guard because of it. And um, those, are, those are valuable point guards, you know? And a, a lot of times if that is you where you are the best defender, but you can't shoot, can't score, can't dribble, can't pass, probably going to be coming off the bench. You know, you're probably going to be the guy coming on. I mean, every coach says the best, def the best defender on the team will play the most, you know, like I've heard yeah. that so many times, but it's never true. They're always the six man. Right. Right. You have to be like an elite level defender, like a Patrick Beverly or, you know what I mean? Like something yeah. like that. And even those guys, I mean, when you think about it, like, the, like, you know, Patrick Beverly is an elite level defender, maybe for the NBA where he's really just looking to lock up and run the team. But in high school and college, he was probably averaging 20, 25 points, you know? So oh, yeah it's, it's a little different, but, but yeah, I, I agree that that's, it can be tough to get a lot of minutes if that's all you can do, but you could still bring some value. Um, I would, I would liken that to, you know, when we talk about big guys and you hear coaches say like, if you can rebound, you're going to play, you know, it's like, and that's true. And you probably will, but if all you can do is rebound and you can't score, you know, you can't like really do a whole lot else. Like you may be limited to just coming off the bench and grabbing some rebounds for, you know, to give those starters a break. And then, you know, you're, gonna, you're only going to play so much. Um, so I, I, I just thought that was a, a, a similar comparison there. But. Yeah. Have you, this is kind of a little off topic, but we, we talked about this a little bit last episode. Have you ever played on a team or coached on a team where you guys would post up your point guard? Um, no, not that I can think of. I've, I'm trying to think back. I mean, high school, definitely not. And in college, we had, I mean, maybe in college, uh, at, when I was a junior college, our, our starting point guard, you know, was, he wasn't super tall, maybe six foot six one, but he had some size to him. And so sometimes he would post up a little bit, but he was very much past first point guard. So he was posting up just to like kick out, you know? Um, but I don't like never strongly, you know, it was never like we were looking to hit him in the post or, or post up something like that. So. that. For some reason, that's just been something that's been on my mind lately. And on, in my head, like you just said, post, there's so much value posting up your point guard because number one, other point guards don't know how to play post defense. Number two, you got a great passer in the post now that can make plays. And number three, you know, typically they should be able to, you know, make a move down there, you throw some shot fakes around and, and finish, you know, they should be able to do a little shimmy, maybe a little fade away or something like that. So um, I would be interested to do some research and just see what teams do that, how they do that. And, you know, just maybe something that both of us can maybe incorporate someday. Yeah. And that's definitely more of like an old school style. If you look back at a little more like nineties basketball um, I can't speak on the eighties. I don't know it as well, but definitely nineties basketball in the NBA or even early two thousands. Like you see a lot of, a lot of point guards would go down on the post, you know? So 
that has definitely faded away as the game has become more spaced out. But I think as with anything, there can become value in it. And um, I'm not a big believer that, you know, modern trends are all right and we should just throw everything away from the past. I think you can still understand the modern trends and say, okay, maybe floor spacing is better, but there are also opportunities to post up your point guard that, you know, if you have that type of player can still create value for you and give you an advantage over the other team. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about like the uniqueness. I know we kind of touched on this a little bit, but what is some of the, the unique aspects of being a point guard? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about pace, right? So if you're the point guard, it's basically, it's not 100% on you, but you've got to understand the pace and you've got to be able to say, all right, I just got the outlet, you know, we're down, by, we just missed four shots in a row, you know, we're going to walk it up, even though typically we would push it right off, off an outlet. Um, so that's one thing that's unique is you got to understand pace a lot more than the other players. Um, I think your skill set has got to be, you, you've got to be a little bit more skilled all around than other players. I mean, like obviously post players don't need to, you know, have their ball handling as good, but um, overall you got to be more skilled than all the other players. Um, like we already mentioned, you, you should probably be in the best shape compared to all the players. Your IQ should be high, higher as far as understanding, you know, your, your offense and your scheme. Um, and I don't know, you, you, you maybe one other thing could be that, you should be able to be trusted with the ball in your hand to take the last shot. Although that's not always the case, but um, I think it would be hard to have a point guard that, that never scored. And then that was never a score to have the ball in his hands at the end of games and kind of rely on that. So whether you can set it, run a set or something for another player, it's just a lot better if you know you have a point guard that can go create his own shot. So maybe there's, there's a good answer there. Point guard, you need to be able to create your own shot. Yeah, I think that is probably, as you were talking, I was thinking about that and then you ended up saying it, but creating your own shot, I think is such a, it's, I don't want to say it's undervalued, but um, I don't think people always look at that when they're thinking of like, okay, how, how can something be valuable? Like, for example, let me, let me explain what I mean by this. A lot of times people talk about like, okay, what's your shooting percentage, catch and shoot, right? Or catch and shoot in a drill, you know, whatever, um, you know, oh, he's a great three point shooter. He can catch and shoot. And that's great. And don't get me wrong, there's value in that. But if, like you said, shot clock's winding down, if you can't put the ball on the floor and shoot, um, or if your percentage goes down by like 25%, then in my opinion, like, it doesn't mean you're not a good shooter, but you're just limited as a shooter. Like, you can only do so much, you know? And to me, a player that can also put the ball on the floor, you know, create space, get a shot up, I just think that their value is, in a lot of cases, is so much higher than a guy that can only catch and shoot, unless that catch and shoot guy is just like elite, you know, like a 50% or 45% three point shooter, and you cannot leave them, you know. Um, and, I, and what I mean, the reason I think that is, is because as you can create for yourself, that also means you can create for other people, you know, if you can create room for yourself or get in the paint almost at, at will, then you should be able to create for other people. The flip side of that, though, is except for rare cases where you have super elite players that are probably, we're talking like pro level guys. Um, how many opportunities in a game do you need one player to just go and create space and get you a bucket, right? Like if you're surviving off your point guard going down 20 times a game and making, you know, step back jump shots, I don't think you're going to be successful as a team. Um, you're more likely to have your shooting guard take like six or seven open kick out threes, you know, and maybe your point guard has once or twice the entire game that they have to go really create, you know, dance a little bit and, and make a shot. So while I think there can be more value in that shot creating, like you talked about, um, if you're just looking at overall percentage of shots, you're probably going to get more just from that catch and shoot player, uh, more opportunities, I guess you should say, I should say. But um, yeah, I don't know. I've always viewed that player that can create off the dribble. In my opinion, I've always been like, that's a better player. That's, you know, again, maybe I'm biased because I always had the ball in my hands as a point guard and I wasn't just standing on the perimeter, but um, just something that I think people often forget. They think of shooting as just like catching and shooting. And it's like, well, it can also be off the dribble. You know, there are two different things there. Yeah. And I think that's another thing, right? Point guards got to be able to shoot off the dribble. And I've heard a lot. I mean, I think maybe even you said that, said it, that you shoot better off the dribble than catch and shoot. I don't know if it was you or someone else, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I was always the opposite, you know, I was always way better catch and shoot than off the dribble. But um, yeah. And, and so as far as creating your own shot, you said it like drawing defenders, right? Like that's like the name of the game as a point guard. If you can just get into the paint and draw defenders all day, 
then you're going to, your team's going to have success because that's what it's all about is creating shots for other people. So yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, that uniqueness is, or that's one thing that is very unique to the point guard position. And I do think we are starting to see more guards, like even at the shooting guard and small forward that can create more, you know, as the game has kind of grown and developed even more. Um, but if you're just looking at it, a kind of a traditional sense, it's generally your, your PG that's going to be doing a lot of that work. So uh, anything else you wanted to add in there before we hit the next topic? No. Okay. Um, so let's see, we talked about uniqueness. Um, okay. So let's talk about the workouts. So how do, how do workouts for point guards differ from other positions? Like what are we looking to do as a point guard compared to someone who's playing the off ball? Yeah. I mean, you touched on it a little bit. So if you are like me as a coach, I'm not a big fan of runners, floaters, those kind of shots, you know, they're lower percentage, but if you are a smaller point guard, then I'm okay with it. Like, what, what are you going to do? Just drive in there and, and try to go against a six, eight guy and just get blocked every time. No, like work, have a nice little floater in your game. And I can think of one player on our varsity team who he's, I've watched him long enough now since I don't know, he, even before high school to know that like, that's his shot. Like he drills floaters. So as a coach for me to say, you know, Hey, no, no one can shoot a floater or a runner, you know, it wouldn't be smart because like he gets a ton of buckets and he's consistent with it. So that'd be something to work on in your workouts is, you know, what, how are you going to finish? How are you going to finish uh, around the basket? Whether it's, you know, you're a Euro step guy or, you know, you can shoot floaters. That'd be something to work on. Um, obviously ball handling and outside shooting, shooting off the dribble, shooting from deep. I mean, you see point guards, a lot of times relying, like if they are really short, relying on the ability to shoot from, you know, NBA or just off the three point line a little bit. So that'd be something to, to um, take into consideration. And then the last thing I'll mention is ball screens. We already said it, but you should be working on ball screens a lot and not just coming off a ball screen, but how to set up your defender to use the ball screen, um, how to reject ball screens. Um, if you have a coach, you know, working with you, what, what the right reads would be, what were the, the fenders will be helping from so where you can dish from for there. Um, but those are the main things that come to mind. Yeah. And I know, you know, when we talk about, at least for myself with a lot of the workouts, you know, I'd always start with catch and shoot 50 mid range makes, you know, and then, and then 50 around the three point line. Like that's pretty, was pretty traditional for me. I know we've done a lot of workouts like that, but then after that, like I always did a lot of stuff with, um, either putting out some type of chair or cone. I mean, I didn't have the luxury to have live defenders always. So using a, a dummy defender and then just working on all different moves into different shots, different finishes. Like I'm going to hit crossovers into pull up jump shots and make five, you know, and then I'm going to go crossovers into, you know, whatever, a step back or a pullback or whatever it is, and then make five. And then, but doing that on both sides of the court with both hands, I think just the more ambidextrous you can become and the more like fluid you can become on both sides, I just think it makes it hard, so much harder to be guarded. And it's really not complex stuff. You know, you see guys coming down and doing like 3000 dribble combos to make a move. And I'm just like, you know, if you can just make one move or two moves in both directions of, of the basic core moves. And when I think of the basic core moves, I'm thinking like a hesitation crossover between the legs behind the back and then maybe a spin move. Like you just can make those five moves and you can maybe do some, co you know, combos of them if you need to, but you can go either direction at all times you don't need to have 10,000 different dribble combos um, because, you know, as long as you can go one direction or the other, really people shouldn't be able to stop you. Like if, as long as, you know, as long as you're crisp with the ball, you're strong with it, you can explode with the ball. So in my head, I'm always like, just work on everything and be well-rounded. Um, it makes it hard to guard because then if they push you one direction, you're like, okay, well, I've, I'm used to going that direction, you know, so I can, I can create off of that. So for me, you know, workouts were always really geared towards, I guess, as we talked about earlier, being able to do stuff off the dribble and like shoot, you know, or, and not that you shouldn't do your catch and shooting, but I know I've heard like really great shooters that are catch and shoot guys are like, Oh, I took a thousand jump shots from the perimeter every day, you know? And, um, and while that's great, I think as a point guard, if that's all you do, you're, you're going to be shaky with handling the ball. You're going to be shaky when someone gets up in you and has to, you know, you've got to handle that pressure. Um, so I would say that's something else that you look at as a work, you know, when you're working out as a PG. Yeah. And I agree with all that too. And one thing we didn't talk about is passing too. I mean, you both hands, right. But I mean, you look at, or you listen to Jason Williams, right. White chocolate, like his, he worked on passing so much, right. Left-handed passing, right-handed passing. I don't know if it was him or pistol Pete through the, 
X on the wall or something in the gym and just worked on passing. But mm -hmm. that's like a lost start right there where, you know, being able to pass with both hands, that's huge. And also not really so much in, in workouts, but maybe if you have a trainer or something that's working with you, like hopefully you're learning, you know, different skills as far as, you know, how to position your body when you're bringing up the ball and keep, you know, your body in between you and the defender. Like that's something that I, I preach a lot about with guys who aren't point guards who, you know, get the ball in the perimeter and I, you know, I, they don't look comfortable and they have a defender on them and they're just like dribbling right in front. I'm like, dude, you got to like get sideways a little bit and protect the ball. Like that, that's all you really got to do and you'll be comfortable. And they're just like, really? I'm like, yeah, just try it. Next time they come down, they're good. You know? So like maybe not in a workout, but in practices and stuff, like I think you need to take that kind of stuff into consideration because a lot of that stuff is just not taught. Like, I don't know if anybody taught me that or not. I'm not sure, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and so also too in your workouts, um, I would say it's never a bad idea as a point guard to always constantly be working on your, your defense and your agility, you know, lateral movement. Um, that was a big one that I remember in college, my college coaches always wanted me to work on, work on your lateral movement, like in the off season, you know, so what, what I need to work on coach, lateral movement, like, and so like that would always stick with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, quickness is king on the court. So if you can, the quicker you can be as a point guard, it's just going to help you out in so many other situations besides scoring and da, 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 just being pressured, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I don't know about you, but like as a point guard myself, like I hated being pressured full courts, that kind of stuff. Like, and I see so many other point guards where it's like, it does not bother them. You know, like if you pick them up full court, they're just like, okay, you know, it's nothing. So mm -hmm. being able to do that, yeah. I think is important. Yeah. I think something you touched on earlier about uh, the body positioning is like a lot of times when kids learn to do a move and I guess, you know, we're talking about, I guess a little younger, maybe middle school, even though high school, I've seen it too. Kids learn to do a move and they can do the move. Like they can do the technicality of it. Like, okay, go between your legs. Cool. He can, you know, he can do it. But then when, when they come off that, that move and are attacking the basket, like, like you said, their body positioning is not right. And so like the ball is like totally exposed. You know, and you're like, okay, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you're doing the move right, but like, I'm going to rip you every time when you do that. You have to be able to protect it. Like, you've got to, you have to angle your body. You've got to be able to do, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, if you, if you jump stop, if you're coming to the lane and you jump stop and you're going to go up for a little floater, like, you can't open up and expose the ball to the defender because it's going to get ripped. So you have to turn your back, you know, and shield it. And then as you go up, you're shielded. And now you square up and score. Like, just little things like that. That I think you're right. Nobody ever taught me that when I was a kid, you know? It was just like, okay, here's the move. Go behind your back. Okay, good luck. You know, figure it out. And I, as I got older, I don't know if it was someone that taught me or just, just playing. I realized it maybe it was even teammates that told me some of that stuff. But um, there's so many little techniques when you're playing at probably any position, but especially, uh, you know, as a point guard, there's so many little techniques that are not – they're not right, right there, like in front of your eyes, you know, you're, if you're just looking at it from a basic level, but as you get deeper into it, you realize, okay, well, if I, if I put myself in this position, it gives me a slight little edge over my defender, but that slight edge is enough to get an open shot or get someone else an open shot or get into the paint. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of those little details that some of them are hard to work on on your own. Like it's hard to work on that if you don't have a live defender with you, Yeah. you know, um, I think that's sometimes where like one-on-one -on -one comes really into, it's really valuable. You can work on those individual skills, playing one-on-one -on -one or, you know, obviously playing five-on-five -five as well, but one-on-one, -on -one, you get the ball every time. So you get to just work on those little skills um, to help you get open. So that's something else that when you talked about positioning, I was like, that's a really good point there. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, let's do our final topic here. What about the opposite side? We talked about all the things you should do, how to become elite, you know, what you should get into if you want to become a good point guard what do you want to avoid what's like the you got your coach pulling their hair out type of thing that you don't want to do two two main things come to mind i'm sure you're thinking of the same ones but the first thing you want to avoid is turnovers so i mean assist to turnover ratio for point guards is like a big one normally the most important one for a lot of coaches you want to have high assists low turnovers um but also over dribbling so uh it's easy if, as, as a point guard to over dribble. And normally the way I see it is if you get the outlet, you should be passing the ball over half court. You shouldn't be dribbling. And of course, sometimes you will dribble it over, but cause you're controlling the pace, but you should always be looking to pass it over half court, whether it's to the opposite side or to the rim runner or to the guy running the same side as you. Um, and if not, then you should be looking to bring it up 
and then get into your offense and get rid of it as soon as you can. And that's a hard thing, I think, for a lot of players to understand because the earlier you give it up in the shot clock as a point guard, the higher chance that you're going to get it back in the possession too. If you pound it for a long time and then give it up, you're never going to get it back. Um, so, yeah, over dribbling and, and turnovers are the first things that come to my mind. Yeah, I would, I would have to agree with that. Those are probably like the two cardinal sins <laughs> that people think of. Um, you know, I guess we could, we could probably find some other things, but, um, you know, just, just being able to, your main job as a point guard is to take care of the ball. You know, um, that's why you're playing that position. And if you can't do that consistently, they're going to find someone else that can. So, uh, I think that's very uh, important. And then maybe another thing I was thinking of is just shot selection because you do have the ball in your hand yeah. all the time. You know, you want to make sure you're not just jacking up stupid shots. Um, that's the easy way to, to lose playing time. Um, or just to hurt the team, you know, so just make sure you're taking good shots because one thing you have to realize is because you have the ball in your hand, you really do dictate who's going to shoot more, you know, and so you have to have that self-control to understand that, hey, you know, I need to get my teammates involved. It's not just about me um, because when the team's involved, it makes it harder to guard. If it's, if you got to guard five guys, it's way, you know, it's harder to win a game guarding five than if you only got a key on one. So that's just something else that popped in my head, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to rack my brain right now and come up with another thing to avoid, but I don't know. It's, it's hard. I mean, fouling is something I think as a point guard, especially if you're going to try to pick up full court, you want to make sure you, you avoid fouling, dumb fouls. Um, and also maybe it's something that you want to look to avoid would be like getting in your own teammates' heads. You know, I, I think as some, I know in college, I was scared of my point guard sometimes because he was like, super hardcore like I didn't want to like mess up you know on the court because of him you know a lot of times so maybe maybe not something to avoid but I think that's just another topic where you got to know how to you know your leadership on the court and talk to your teammates and you know get them going that way vocally is something that is also important yeah communication skills I think yeah yeah, it's a really good one and we didn't really touch on that a whole lot but yeah, it's one thing to be vocal and just be a jerk, you know, and just call out someone every time they they do something wrong. It's another thing to be a leader and hold people accountable, which you can still do, um, but uplift them and say, hey, like, that's not a good shot, but let's get the next one. You know, we got you as opposed to just like ripping them and being like, what are you doing? That's terrible shot. You know, and I get it. There may be a time here and there where that'll happen. But like, you can't do that all day, every game. Like, first of all, people are going to tune you out. And secondly, you do destroy confidence. I don't really care what anyone says about that. Like that type of playing and and coaching style in general, you're just constantly ripping people. Like they lose confidence because they don't want to hear it anymore. And they just feel like crap, you know? Um, And I've seen good players that are swayed so much by their confidence that like they could be really, really good or really, really poor because, you know, depending on how they're being communicated to. And yeah, I get it. Some people say, well, that's soft or like whatever this on the other, but at the end of the day, like it's part of human beings and how we are, you know? So mm-hmm. you can, you can either learn and make your players better, or you can be the fake tough guy that says like, Oh, you're, I'm just not going to deal with the softness, but, but you're going to make your players worse. You know, like it, it is what it is. So what do you really want to do? Do you want to adapt and win? Or do you want to be, you know, the old school coach that all you care about is, or, or old school player, I should say at this point where all you care about is, you know, this ego of toughness. And I just think that that's something that gets a lot. And I, I don't think from players it happens as much. I think it's more coaches, but you're right. There are sometimes um, players that you play with where it's like, geez, man, like, you know, it, it becomes one of those things where if you're going to call everyone else out all the time, you better be perfect, you know, like, because mm-hmm. once you make a mistake, you're going to lose all credibility. So I think that's the tough part of playing that angle. Yeah, no, I agree. All right. Any last thoughts before we get out of here? No, I just, uh, if you are a point guard, you know, go look at different point guards from the past, right? There are so many different styles. Go, you know, watch some Jason Williams stuff, some Pistol Pete stuff, some Mark Jackson stuff, just, you know, John Stockton stuff. There's so many good point guards from the past that, and I'm talking to a younger point guard right now, you don't need to watch NBA and think that you need to be, you know, like the, the typical NBA point guard nowadays. Yeah. And I I think kind of to add on to that, it's just find a style that works for you and you can be successful in, you know, know what you can and can't do. If you're not a six foot six point guard, that's, you know, a freak athlete, then you're not going to probably be able to play that style. Like if you're a small guard, learn to shoot, take care of the ball, you know, be secure with it. Um, 
if you're bigger, use that to your advantage. And, you know, obviously you should still try and learn all those skills, even as a larger guard, but, but you really got to understand like, Hey, if I'm six, five, six, six, I might be able to get to the rim a little more than, you know, a five, 10 point guard. Um, and just play to your strengths. I know you've, you've said this was play your strengths, hide your weaknesses. You know, it's the same thing with any position, but especially at the point guard, just understand that uh, because your role is so unique, you know, there's some things we, you all have to have got to be a leader, got to be vocal. I think those are all things that are important no matter what type of point guard you are, but, but then I'll go from there and be like, okay, here's my, my body style and how I move and how I react and then find something that fits for you. And I think you can be successful no matter, no matter how tall or short you are, you know? Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for watching and, and listening and tuning in today. Um, as you know, Augie and I are both point guards. We like talking about this though. So sometimes we get a little long winded, but this was a, I thought it was a good episode to talk about, you know, how to become a point guard. So again, thank you for listening. Uh, we really appreciate all of your support. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, or watching on YouTube, please make sure to like and subscribe. As you all know, we come out with a new episode once a week, and we hope to see you guys all in the next one. Peace.